down his marker with crystal clarity in a national broadcast entitled In Nobody's Backyard. You remember that one? You remember the lyrics in that one? I am sure that it is well with our soul to quote this speech at some length. Let's begin. Let's hear what Morris said. Quote, we are a small country. We are a poor country with a population of largely African descent. We are a part of the exploited third world and we definitely have a stake in seeking the creation of a new international economic order which will assist in ensuring economic justice for the oppressed and exploited peoples of the world and ensuring that the resources of the land and sea are used for the benefit of all the people of the world and not for a tiny minority of profiteers. When last year a man talked like that. Continues. Our aim, therefore, is to join all organizations and work with all countries that will help us become more independent and more in control of our resources. In this regard, nobody who understands present day realities can seriously challenge our right to develop working relations with a variety of countries. Okay. And then hear Morris again, finally, from this speech. No, we want more, we want more. Grenada is a sovereign and independent country. Although a tiny speck on the world map. And we expect all countries to strictly respect our independence just as we will respect theirs. No country has the right to tell us what to do or how to run our country or who to be friendly with. We certainly would not attempt to tell any other country what to do. We are not in anybody's backyard and we are definitely not for sale. This fighting spirit, these noble ideas are what fuel the drive to build this international airport. They too sustain us in our legitimate ongoing quest to further ennoble our Caribbean civilization. I cannot recall when I first met Morris Bishop. It was some years prior to the revolution, but we had known each other in revolutionary spirit long before that. So we knew each other before we met each other. In the 10 years prior to the revolution, I had come to the attention of the security forces of the region and the hemisphere in the Cold War era. Not for the commission of any crime, but on account of my anti-imperialist, revolutionary democratic and socialist oriented political activities. And I told all to change. <laughs> on October the 16th, 1968, at the age of 22 years, as the leader of the Students' Union at the University of the West Indies, Jamaica, I led arguably the largest protest in that country since the momentous and popular anti-colonial uprising of 1938. The symbol of our defense and affirmation of solidarity was the Guyanese scholar and revolutionary activist, Walter Rodney, who was banned by the Jamaican government from returning to his post as a university lecturer, consequent upon his attendance of a Black Writers' Conference in Montreal, Canada. We were beaten and tear-gassed by the Jamaican security forces. And the leadership of the popular mass movement was vilified, harassed, and persecuted by imperialism and new imperial surrogates. Between October 1968 and 1979, for example, at one time or another, I was denied entry into several Caribbean countries 
include in Grenada, <laughs> St. Lucia and Antigua. After one time, is a next. I couldn't come in at Pearls, but I'm the feature speaker at Consulates. In December 1979, my work permit as a university lecturer at Cavill was revoked by the Barbadian government and my residency in that country cancelled. I was in the language of the day, persona non grata. At one stroke, I was denied an opportunity to work in my chosen profession in my region. I had a wife and child to mine. This is, alas, but a glimpse of those terrible days when the faces of ordinary men and women across this region were strained and anxious. Still, as my Rastafari brethren and sisterin would say, I and I survive and thrive. There is no malice. Just the love from I and I. In Grenada, Morris Bishop and his comrades fared worse of all. They were threatened with imminent physical liquidation, a matter on which no chances could be taken, given the history of barbarism against them and the working people by the regime of the day. I shall never forget the morning of March the 13th, 1979. I was living at Paradise Heights, near to the university in Barbados, where I was employed as a lecturer. My friend, a young St. Lucian named Didicus Jules, he's here, who subsequently worked in the field of education under the People's Revolutionary Government and is now the Chief Executive Officer of the Caribbean Examination Council telephoned me around 7 or so that morning and reported that the Gary regime had been overthrown in Grenada but he was unsure as to what had in fact transpired. Swiftly thereafter, I ascertained the truth. I was ecstatic. Weeping had endured for a long night but joy had come that morning. God is a good God. Yes, he lives. A redemption song was being sung on the streets of Grenada. In the undulating valleys and on the hillsides, the plains and on the beaches. Within a week of the revolution, Morris invited me to Grenada. I did so on the second Saturday of the revolution and immediately immersed myself in political work under his direction at his home where I was to be accommodated for a few days. There was so much to be done, sleep barely encroached. In any event, Morris showed me my room. Inside of it was located the telecommunications equipment and those were the early days. I knew immediately that the nights would be long and sleepless. sleepless. Frequently there were noisy radio calls for Papa Mike, the code name for Morris. The next day, the second Sunday of the Revo, there was a massive rally at Simoon in Grenville. 